all too often games are revealed years before they are released. Some cutting edge out of engine cinematic to show off the next big thing. Then radio silence, or in some severe cases, a disastrous launch with an unfinished product that had no right being revealed so early in development. This was my concern with Tears of the Kingdom last summer. At that point, we'd only seen a teaser in one official trailer that only raised more questions than answers. For over three years, we had no clue what this game was, and that led to expectations so large that no normal game could ever possibly reach. But damn it, Tears of the Kingdom is not a normal game. It feels almost criminal that Tears of the Kingdom is so much better than its predecessor when Breath of the Wild is also one of the most widely loved and critically acclaimed games ever created. Tears of the Kingdom had the astronomical task of following up the best-selling and most popular Zelda title, but it did so and in a way that almost ruins Breath of the Wild. I mean, I've seen folks online calling Breath of the Wild a tech demo. While I don't think I'd go that far, I will say that Breath of the Wild feels like the Zelda team's experimentation of open world Zelda, where Tears of the Kingdom is the execution. This game takes the foundation that Breath of the Wild built and capitalizes on it by fleshing out the world and addressing many of the glaring issues that Breath of the Wild had. So much so that I'm not sure I could go back and play Breath of the Wild now without seeing how lesser it is in comparison. Tears is a massive game with so much going on and so much to do that it can honestly feel overwhelming. That's not something I would have said with Breath of the Wild. Or Breath of the Wild left you longing for more to do and see, Tears exceeds by providing so much side material and additional content. Meaningful side content. We all know that the emptiness of Hyrule was a large complaint in the first game. But here there's so much new life and activity in Hyrule that it's almost impossible to not find something while you're out exploring. Countless times I would progress a mission only to get distracted by the numerous amounts of content on the way. Take Stables for an example. Stables in Tears of the Kingdom have a whole expansive questline tied to them, but also have whales that can be explored and plundered that is also part of another questline. There's the new stable point system that rewards you for visiting or staying at a stable, not to mention there's a really strong chance you'll see some helpless Korok that needs you to shuffle his lazy little stump over to his friend. Certain stables near the Great Fairies have yet another questline that directly correlates to them, and that quest happened to be one of my favorites from the entire game. All of this is just around a stable. One singular location that previously offered lodging for you and your horse and the occasional treasure chest from a helpful pup. They're now beaming with life and experiences. That example translates to the whole game. I... I am the daughter of King Rome of Hyrule, Zelda. Probably the aspect of this game that I was most excited about was the story. The teasers and trailers did little to explain the plot and the game just had such an air of mystery surrounding it that it made it seem like it was going to be huge. The story begins with Link and Zelda investigating far below Hyrule Castle where an ominous haze has begun to seep out into Hyrule, infecting the citizens and getting them sick. Traversing the ruins, Zelda discovers that they are of ancient Zonai creation and finds a mural depicting the Imprisoning War. No, not that Imprisoning War. This is a new one. After fangirling hard over her discovery, the pair continue further deep where they happen upon the mummified corpse of Ganondorf. Upon their approach, the hand sealing Ganondorf falls to the ground and an artifact known as a secret stone lands at Zelda's feet. Ganondorf awakens and attempts to attack Zelda before Link intervenes, but not without a cost. The Master Sword is shattered and Link's hand is heavily damaged. This sequence is one of my favorites from the whole game. Ganondorf's mocking of the would-be hero and blade that is supposed to be his undoing is so good. From the beginning, you get a taste of the power and hatred that Ganondorf possesses. The delivery of his lines held me captive. I'll get into that a little bit later. But from here, Ganondorf unleashes his gloom and the ground beneath begins to crumble. 
Zelda falls as Link jumps to grab her, but it's too late. She falls, and a golden light encompasses her, and she vanishes. Link's fall is halted by the arm, and he's whisked away as Ganondorf falls deeper into the depths of Hyrule. When Link awakens, he's on the Great Sky Island, and after exploring and gaining new abilities, he's met with the Spirit of the Arm, the first king of Hyrule, a Zonai by the name Raru. Raru tells Link that everything is now up to him to stop Ganondorf. Link then approaches a glowing light where the Master Sword is teleported back through time and lands in the hands of Princess Zelda, who is trapped in Hyrule of the past. Link then returns to the surface and meets with Pura, who I'm shocked people are just now realizing how fine she is. Like, did you guys not play Age of Calamity? But, you know, I, I, I get you. She is somehow more fine in Tears of the Kingdom. Pura tells Link of strange happenings across the four major regions of Hyrule and rumors of Princess Zelda being spotted near there. This is where the main progression of the story really begins. I'm not going to go into grave detail about the plot for each of these locations, as you really should experience all that yourselves, and if you're watching this, then you damn well better have already. Instead, I would like to talk about presentation and structure of the plot, as well as key moments that stood out for me and left an impression. Another one of the largest criticisms for Breath of the Wild was its story or lack thereof. Breath of the Wild felt more like a disjointed history lesson on the events leading up to the Calamity instead of a story you were actively a part of. Here's goes about this a little differently by finding a middle ground with this story direction. Memories make a return in the form of tears found at the geoglyphs and show a part of the distant past that Zelda lived through. These memories are completely open to watch with no restrictions on plot progression, instead relying on your ability to track them. I'm not sure why I thought this storytelling design would change in Tears of the Kingdom when it's so obvious that Nintendo wants you to find the plot as you explore exactly how you did in Breath of the Wild. It is a sequel, but the gameplay philosophy certainly didn't change. Now I tried. I really did try to pace myself and look at the memories in small increments or after completing major parts of a quest. But I eventually caved and binged every single memory back to back, and man, I kinda regretted it immediately. Don't get me wrong, I wanted to know what happened in the story, and dear lord, there's some absolutely wild story beats, but we'll get to that in a moment. But that was it. Most of the plot I knew with a huge amount of the game left. I didn't know how much or when the next major moment was going to be, or if there would be that many left at all. It made me realize that I think I prefer the traditional approach to storytelling in a Zelda game. If for no other reason than I just can't control myself. Linearity is the antithesis of these games, and I get that. But I can't help but feel the middling approach of memories at your own convenience and structured plot points in major areas just feels like the direction didn't have an identity. Additionally, memories have an issue in and of themselves. There's so much left on the table with the memories. Parts of the story just seem completely missing. It's not uncommon to feel like you missed something, and I imagine viewing them out of order only makes that worse. Additionally, major events like the Sage's battle against Ganondorf are merely alluded to. I don't know about you, but I would have loved to have actually watched that play out. It just felt very rushed at times, and that could be a symptom of me watching them back to back, but regardless, it did feel lesser because of it. It was also disappointing seeing the exact same cutscene play out for all these sages with nearly identical dialogue. If there's one thing I can say for sure that's a huge miss with this game, it's that. There's also a greater conversation to be had about the lore and overall impact this game has on the series and timeline, and that's a topic I think is worth discussing, but for me, this really feels like the Zelda team has just soft rebooted the franchise and has started a new continuity in the series. There's way too many inconsistencies with pre-existing lore, and in classic Zelda fashion, a lot is left up to interpretation and speculation. I just don't think the Zelda team really cares all that much about exact timeline placements anymore. A.G. Aonuma's constant dodging of hard confirmation and comments on leaving it up to fans really drives it home to me that they care more about telling a contained legend rather than one that has to be firmly rooted in the convoluted annals of Zelda history. Plus, their gameplay first, story second approach has long meant that it's not their main concern when developing. But, all that being said, this story was amazing. It's not reinventing the wheel by any means, and I'd say it's about what you'd expect out of a Breath of the Wild sequel. There's not a giant complex narrative with grandiose ideas and huge plot twists, but there are some absolutely incredible moments in this game. Let's start back at the beginning. The opening moments with Ganon Corpse reanimating back to life immediately hooked me. 
Matthew Mercer's delivery and VA work in this game has been impressively good. I think overall the VA work is better, but every time Ganondorf appeared on the screen, he stole the show. The line he utters about that being the sword that seals the darkness has to be one of the hardest lines Ganondorf across the series has said. It's so mocking and belittling to an established hero in Zelda that already fought an iteration of Ganon. From the rip, you knew this Ganondorf meant business, and it was personal. I love this Ganondorf so much. I think he's probably the best representation that we've had of the villain yet. There's so many awesome callbacks with this Ganondorf. The memory of him bending the knee to the King of Hyrule is so obviously a reference to Ocarina of Time. The fact that one of my favorite all-time Zelda plot devices returns with Puppet Zelda made me giddy as a schoolgirl. I remember talking with a friend in the very early game that Zelda sounded really weird during the Blood Moon scene and the VA felt off. And then, over the course of visiting the other regions, it began to sink in that this was Ganondorf. But when he actually said that it was his puppet, I probably squealed. This moment in the sanctuary was when I knew this game had a chance at dethroning Twilight Princess as my favorite Zelda. I'm not sure if my experience is the same as a lot of you, but when I see the gloom hands, I run. So by this point, I had no idea what spawns once they are defeated. Seeing the title Phantom Ganon appear on my screen made me lose my mind. I had no doubt at this point that this was a full-blown Zelda game. Zelda story, man, like where do you even begin? There was no chance anyone saw this story playing out the way it did. From the moment the idea of draconification was mentioned, it clicked. I audibly said there's no fucking way Zelda is the dragon. Her story is so important in this game, and the times where you get to see her take on the leadership role and do what is necessary for the safety of her kingdom do so much for her as a character and makes her story one of the saddest in the series. She sacrifices herself to become an immortal dragon to roam the skies for thousands upon thousands of years to restore the Master Sword for Link. Which can I say, the Master Sword scene in this game might be the best one series wide. It's beautiful, and the connection with Zelda is ever apparent as she talks about restoring your sword for you. All the while, we are told Zelda is not coming back, and up until the very last moments, it looks that way. The final battle with Ganondorf slash Demon King when he undergoes draconification left me jaw dropped because I didn't think that would be an option for him. But having Zelda, the Light Dragon, assist you in defeating him was one of the best moments in the entire game. The fight is so cinematic and weighty and while it's cursed to the same fate as Dark Beast Ganon by being way too easy, I couldn't help but feel a huge sense of urgency and pressure to finish him off. Doing so rewarded me with my favorite moment in this game. The final scene with Queen Sonya and King Raru aiding Link to reclaim his Zelda and free her of her unfortunate duty is so powerful. But even more powerful was the decision to give the player the option to dive and rescue her. I can't explain to you how this scene properly makes me feel. From the moment Zelda was being rescued, I was crying. When I had to dive after her, I was openly weeping. The reunion was beautiful and heartfelt, and goddamn Nintendo, they don't gotta kiss, but please just let them hug one another. Damn, they've been through a lot. A large concern for a lot of fans going into the sequel was whether or not playing in the same game world that we have for the last six years would even be interesting or worthwhile. Would there be enough changes to make exploring this familiar land fun and engaging? The marketing for this game would have you believe that the focused and largest addition is the Sky Islands. While the Sky Islands do offer a myriad of activities, they shockingly seem to be the area that's least impressive. I'd chalk this up as bad marketing and wanting to keep most of the game a secret, but I bet most of us believe that the Sky Islands were going to play a much more significant part in this game. There's certainly moments where they are the prime setting and focus, but most of the time they are just background noise. Outside of the two dungeons and Great Sky Island, most of the other islands are sparsely populated and only offer the occasional puzzle, shrine, or flux construct battle. It's really surprising to me just how little there is to do up there. Their reason for existing in this game at all also kind of feels like an afterthought. During my playthrough, I was waiting for the moment when someone was going to tell me about why the Sky Islands exist and why we couldn't see them this whole time. 
only for a random construct placed out of the way on top of the Sky Temple of Time to tell me in a Cliff Notes fashion style that the sages used their powers to raise the lands to the sky for Link in the future to recover. This construct also presents this quest like it's a huge cryptic secret and won't tell you till after you complete a pretty challenging task. Just for this guy to tell you in like three sentences why a major part of this game even exists. Maybe I'm wrong and there's more info out there, but I would much prefer that be a more integral part of the narrative and not an answer you would quickly write down at the end of a time test. I spent the least amount of my time playing this game in the Sky Islands for that reason. I do think they excel at presenting this ancient sacred aesthetic. There's no denying the beauty of the Sky Islands. Seeing the clouds roll in or a sunset from above feels so otherworldly. Traversing the Sky Islands is also where a lot of the enjoyment comes from. You could get launched out of the cannons that are the sky view towers, or use recall and ride a floating boulder back to the heavens. Going from island to island is completely reliant on how you, the player, wants to do it. You could skydive to lower islands and glide over to them, or build an elaborate plane or device to reach them. Sky islands succeed as a spectacle and set piece more than they do as a part of the story. What they lack in depth and substance is made up for by their utility and visual appeal. The surface of Hyrule has changed very little, instead being more dependent on things to do rather than new sights to see. And I don't think that's a bad thing. This is the largest Hyrule ever created with tons of varying environments and places to see. I know not everyone will feel this way, but I really don't have an issue exploring a world I've already extensively traveled. In fact, I think I felt more compelled to search the surface because I wanted to know if there were any major changes. This is where all the new stuff to do in the game comes into play. Hyrule felt fresh because it feels lived in and fully fleshed out. It's nearly impossible for me to go into a major area or village and not interact with every single NPC and activate every quest I can find. Why? Because they have substance and character and feel more detailed than they ever did in Breath of the Wild. That's not to say this is the exact same Hyrule. Many of the main villages have been altered or are affected by some side effects of Ganondorf's revival. Take Rito Village for an example. The village is being ravaged by a blizzard and all of the adults spare Teba and his wife are out scavenging for food and resources, leaving only the children behind to tend to the village. It's a completely different scenario in Tears of the Kingdom. These afflictions to major areas make it so much more interesting to explore this time around. A huge contributor to that is the new caves that are dotted across the kingdom. There was a severe lack of cave exploration in Breath of the Wild and the Zelda team addressed it extensively. There are so many caves in this game with tons of variety. Some can be fairly short, while others are extensive networks and connect into other chambers. Not every cave holds the same to-do list outside of shooting the bubble frog, of course, but you might end up fighting a stone talus, or discovering a shrine, or finding a lost piece of bandit treasure. There's so much incentive to explore and seek out areas in the overworld. While there is a ton of new in Hyrule, some of the old from Breath of the Wild just isn't there. The decision to completely remove any trace of pre-existing Sheikah tech is a strange one. The towers and shrines I can see, but completely removing the Shrine of Resurrection felt so off and did make me a little disappointed. Also, I don't know if I just didn't find it or find someone who mentioned it, but there's such a strong dedication of pretending the Sheikah Slate and most Sheikah tech don't exist in this game. It feels so weird to me for a sequel to not involve or at the bare minimum address what happened to the primary theming and subjects of the previous game. It's not a deal breaker by any means, but it does baffle me why no one brings it up. Additionally, there's a ton of new NPCs roaming around and it's not really addressed where they came from. Again, not a huge deal, but it does rub me the wrong way when I, the hero of Hyrule Link, am treated like a complete and total stranger. I get this is probably Nintendo's way of making the game accessible to new players who never played Breath of the Wild, but man, if you had saved that on your Switch from Breath of the Wild, it would have been great to have been acknowledged more and actually recognized. Regardless, having all these new NPCs and characters to interact with are another main reason that Hyrule doesn't feel old and boring. There's always going to be someone new to talk to no matter what area you go to. Those old familiar faces will recognize you, and that is nice I will say, but come on man, these villages are small. Word of mouth should be enough for these people to know who I am. Maybe the biggest change to the world of Hyrule is the depths. Underneath the kingdom is a map of pretty much equal size with its own unique experiences and gameplay loops. Giant chasms have appeared after the upheaval and take you deep into unknown territory that is completely shrouded in darkness. Your only ways to see what's around you is to light up the area via a light route or through bright bloom seeds that light up small areas around where they land. 
The depths are what make this game feel so large. An entire land untouched that we've never seen before that is also the inverse of Hyrule, making it feel both familiar and new simultaneously. There is so much to the depths. Gloom, which is amped up malice, plays a major factor. After coming into contact with it, you will lose a heart for every time it affects you. It's a semi-permanent loss, as you can only recover those hearts through special gloom-resistant foods and armor, or by traveling to a light route or back to the surface. This adds a level of challenge to the depths that you don't really get anywhere else. Wandering through the pitch black, not knowing if you're about to creep up on a giant frox and stumble straight into a giant puddle of gloom, makes it very difficult to explore on foot down here. You simply just do not know what's around the corner. Experimentation with your travel options is put to the test in the depths. Before getting Minoru's construct, which provides a way to walk across the gloom, you have to find creative ways to cross these large patches. Smaller streams you can run across before the gloom affects you, but for those larger ones, using Ultra Hand to create a vehicle is the primary way to go about it. The depths do such a great job at world building by housing the mining facilities and construct factories in the same locations as major settlements in the overworld the production of Zonite being the main purpose of these ruins. Pose make a return in the depths as well, and work as an additional currency you can use to purchase dark-themed items and armor from statues of biblically accurate Hylia. It's an extremely cool detail to have this ancient ruinous kingdom portray the main deity in a different light. Pose most commonly take the shape of a will-o'-the-wisp, with some being a bit larger and counting for more Pose souls. I was initially a little disappointed that the cool Grim Reaper-esque design we saw in Twilight Princess didn't make a return, but after exploring a bit more, I came across the Lost Souls of Soldiers. These soldiers offering Link a weapon and then disappearing has got to be one of the best small details in this game. The implication that these, I'm assuming, Poes can't move on without aiding in the defeat of the Demon King in some way is a wonderful detail that breathes life into this Lost Abyss below. Again though, it feels strange that the origins of the depths aren't explained either. Was this giant underground kingdom just there the whole time, and the Zonai went back and forth between there and the surface? Was it previously a part of the overworld, and some catastrophic event caused a fissure to swallow the kingdom up? Ganondorf's ceiling chamber is underground, but there's never a mention of going underground or the depths at all during the story. I don't know, and it really bothers me because they just expect us to accept that it's a thing without explaining the deeper reason. I guess I should be used to that by now because this is a Zelda game. Ask dedicated Zelda fans what was missing from Breath of the Wild and I guarantee you one of the first things you'll hear is traditional dungeons. Tears of the Kingdom remedied this complaint by reintroducing thematic dungeons. The Divine Beasts of Breath of the Wild lacked enough variety to truly make them stand out in the greater history of Zelda dungeons, and I'm really pleased to say that the uniqueness and theming in this game is leagues better. Dungeons in Tears of the Kingdom take a more open approach with long build-up sequences and obstacles that gradually lead you into the temples. This not only works extremely well for the open nature and design of a game like Tears of the Kingdom, but does an excellent job at making these areas feel important and engaging. I completed the Wind Temple first. Using various sky islands and floating trampoline warships to ascend the skies to reach Stormwind Arc created a giant sense of scale. It's large and open and feels natural to the world. The giant sky ship is a great example of making the player think outside the boundaries of a dungeon. In a traditional Zelda, if you left off the side of this ship, you'd be greeted with a game over screen or placed back at the point you jumped from. With the open design of Tears of the Kingdom, there's a whole new dynamic to dungeon exploration. The game wants you to color outside the lines, so to say. It's not a situation of limiting exploration with Dungeons and Tears of the Kingdom, but rather the expectation that you will approach them from a non-traditional method. They created these temples with the idea of using game-breaking design instead of making a single option of completion. You aren't punished for solving a puzzle in a way that might have never been intended, but rather celebrated for using the new game mechanics in a way that works for you. Because of this, there's no technically right way to solve anything in this game, making everyone's own experience unique and personal to them. Stormwind Arc was a great temple to start with because it really set the expectation for what dungeons in this game would be like. Really, I think all the dungeons do a good job at this, and it's probably intentional game design to have them all structured in the same ways, but varied enough to where they feel like unique experiences and can be completed in any order. 
Each of the regional disturbance quests have you work with the respective villages to solve the problem afflicting them. Rito Village is engulfed in a blizzard, Goron City with an addictive food poisoning its citizens, Sludge polluting the waters of Zora's domain, and a sandstorm blasting Gerudo Town while they fight off hordes of Gibdos. The structure for solving all these issues is the same, but the individual stories and problems are unique to those areas. This was a huge factor in making this game feel like a traditional Zelda for me. Having a storyline to follow and resolving an issue before making your way to the temple was a familiar itch that Tears of the Kingdom scratched perfectly. Certain areas felt so classic Zelda, like the ancient Zora waterworks. From the moment you step foot down there, it feels so immediately like old school water temples and was one of my favorite areas to explore. The Fire Temple especially does a great job at replicating traditional dungeon vibes. This temple more than any of the others used atmosphere, environment, and presentation in a way that makes you think back to titles like Skyward Sword or Twilight Princess. That doesn't mean the others do a bad job at it, I just think the more open approach with them sets them apart. Crawling through the depths to reach this temple made it feel a lot more closed off and isolated. The Lightning Temple feels this way as well, but not to the same degree. I'm not sure if it's mainly the fact that the Fire Temple is in the depths and feels more isolated due to the darkness, because even with the Spirit Temple, it's more about the openness and lead up to the temple itself rather than the temple. Both design philosophies work extremely well in this game, but going off the blueprint of older dungeons, the Fire Temple does the best at replicating that feeling. But is it the best dungeon? Well, maybe. Every dungeon in this game tends to exceed where the others fall short. For example, let's take the Lightning Temple. While all of the dungeons in Tears of the Kingdom are fairly one-dimensional and revolve around one core puzzle gimmick and unlocking five locks, some of the dungeon designs aren't nearly as interesting as the others, like the Lightning Temple. I think it might be my least favorite dungeon from a structure standpoint, but it easily has the best boss. Queen Gibdo made me feel like I was playing a Souls game. It was such a stark comparison compared to the other bosses. The spike in difficulty was noticeable. The large open setting of the first encounter felt epic, where the final battle was more intimate and closed off, creating a more anxiety-inducing fight. They definitely stuck with the idea of keeping the desert boss the most challenging. For other dungeons, the lead-up had more substance than the temple itself. The Water Temple and Spirit Temple both come to mind. The Water Temple is likely the easiest temple to complete and is very small in scale but does an excellent job with presentation and atmosphere. The Spirit Temple is nothing but a boss chamber and it didn't even dawn on me that I was doing a dungeon until the boss fight started. Also the sequence of getting to the 5th Sage felt a little weird to me. I randomly stumbled upon the artifact that begins the quest in the thunderstorm over Farron purely out of curiosity. It felt like I missed a step or part of the story and that I shouldn't have been there yet. Uh, editor's note. It's probably because I wasn't supposed to be there yet because my dumbass somehow completely missed an entire main quest that leads you directly to this place and tells you that this is where you need to go. So yeah, you can uh, you can strike this one from the books. I took an L on this one, Jesus. But anyways, the open nature of the construct factory and piecing all of Minoru's construct body parts together was a great example of creating a dungeon environment that doesn't feel isolated or enclosed. Both of these temples did something really necessary with their bosses by making them on the sillier side. I think it's easy to get lost in the mindset of a dark foreboding Zelda game, but it's still a Zelda game and that means we need those goofy encounters every so often. The sieged construct boss fight is so Zelda that it's not even funny. A giant robot boxing match, like come on who wouldn't love that? Monk to Rock had a very fun gameplay loop with clearing out the sludge and virtually pressure washing the shark away to attack it. Both of these bosses were fun and had that Zelda flair that you just did not get with the Blight Ganons in Breath of the Wild. The bosses overall were significantly better this time around. Giant epic fights with Kolgara and returning staples like Goma helped give this game an identity that its predecessor was severely lacking. The gameplay for Tears of the Kingdom is revolutionary. The intention of giving the player full creative freedom to tackle this world in any way they see fit not only creates a game with endless possibilities, but creates a deeply personal gameplay experience. The core loop in Tears of the Kingdom revolves around the use of Link's new abilities. Ultra Hand creates mechanisms that help you engage with the world. The Fuse ability allows you to create your own weapons and combat scenarios through sheer diversity of materials. Ascend further complements the verticality of this game by allowing you to phase through structures. 
Recall offers a means of gameplay opportunities by working as a combat feature, an exploration feature, and a building feature when your Ultra Hand creations decide to take off without you. This game is more about finding your own ways to complete objectives. The Zelda team gave you the tools, but no cut and dry answer on how they should be used. Impressively, the thing that surprises me is just how good the game runs for what it's doing. Sure, 30 frames in 2023 is laughable, but the game has never crashed on me, and it still looks incredible and plays great on dated hardware. The technical achievement of this game should be celebrated, and I'm happy to see that it is from so many developers and gamers online. Shrines make a return, and I was a little iffy about it to begin with, but to my surprise, they are noticeably better. The puzzles this time around were a lot more fulfilling to solve and didn't frustrate me as much as I would have come to expect. The sheer number of them is still daunting, and grinding them caused me to hit a wall and take my first real break from the game. Granted, that was after I had completed 80 of them. But the creativity of some of these shrines can't be ignored. They put Jenga in this game, like how could you not have fun doing that? Rewards from these shrines are fairly inconsistent, and honestly, I found myself not even bothering to try for the chests a lot of the time. But overall, they are significantly better in Tears of the Kingdom, even though there's about 30 more of them than in Breath of the Wild. The combat has stayed relatively the same, excluding the fuse mechanic. But the new enemies introduced in this game have created all new moments of terror and excitement. Take gloom hands. These are straight nightmare fuel and are relentless. If you are unfortunate enough to get grabbed, you'll get gloom damage and also dropped right in front of them just so they can grab you once again. If you are lucky or skilled enough to defeat them, then guess what? Here comes Phantom Ganon. Gluck is much the same way. An extremely challenging enemy that if you aren't perfect when fighting will absolutely clap your cheeks and not call you in the morning. Where Breath of the Wild really only offered Lionels as the main fierce enemy to fight, Tears has expanded with more brutal and punishing encounters. I love that this game is hard. It's so rewarding to spend a decent chunk of time on an enemy and finally kill it. Learning the timings and tricks to make the fights easier do a great job of building the power fantasy. Most returning gameplay elements in Tears of the Kingdom are a drastic upgrade, making them feel like a rough draft in Breath of the Wild. Side quests and adventures in Tears of the Kingdom have got to be one of the best improvements in the entire game. Most of the quests I completed didn't feel like a waste of time, and even if the in-game reward wasn't all that, the experiences and stories that they offer more than make up for it. I alluded to the Great Fairies quest earlier. Maybe it's just because music is so important in my life and I'm a musician myself, but getting the band back together and having this beautiful quartet slowly reform over the course of the game was magical for me. Having another part added to the song each time was a very satisfying part of this quest, and certain moments of the quest really had their own time to shine. This was a standout moment for me. Piper playing his flute in the trees to make this little girl happy was such a wonderful moment of quiet peace that really puts into perspective the need to defeat Ganondorf. Larger quest lines like the one in Hatano Village rival the level of depth that we saw with the Terrytown quest in Breath of the Wild, but there's more of them this time. These larger overarching side quests do wonders for the world building and player engagement. The Hatano Village Mayor storyline has you looking at multiple perspectives and interacting with a wide variety of villagers. I didn't think finding a lost cheese recipe would play such a pivotal part, but here we are. Nothing feels like it's a throwaway moment in these side quests. Even the menial tasks like Koroks or helping Addison put up signs can offer a chance to flex your creative muscles, making what many might consider throwaway moments more engaging. Koroks can still leave a lot to be desired, but the internet sure has had a blast finding creative and hilarious ways to torture these little guys. Monster control crew missions make clearing out encampments a lot more compelling by having you lead the helm of a small militia to reclaim Hyrule. Fighting alongside the other races of Hyrule might not mean you're getting effective help from them all the time, but it does wonders in creating a living world and sense of companionship. There's so much more to do this time around with content that fleshes out the world of Hyrule. The complaints of emptiness do not apply to Tears of the Kingdom. There's no such thing as a flawless game, and no exception is made with Tears of the Kingdom. That being said, most of my issues are fairly nitpicky. Like, why can't we pet the dog, Nintendo? Why do I have to manually pick up rupees that appear in the wild? Shouldn't I just automatically do that? That feels like ancient game design. Dungeons have giant build-up sequences, but the temples themselves could have been a bit longer and not so reliant on one puzzle mechanic. 
Sonya says Zelda is a descendant of hers, but she dies? So did they just have a secret kid running around, or is this just a plot hole we need to ignore? Dear Lord, there is so much going on on my screen. I cannot see through all five stages at once, and I don't want to turn them off because I use them pretty frequently. Why on Hylia's Green Earth can I not upgrade the Archaic Armor? You literally spend years marketing this game with this awesome looking gear that you don't elaborate on or give us the possibility to use at pretty much any point during the game without getting absolutely demolished. Why do we have to change the terminology to gloom from malice? Like it's more dangerous, sure, but was that really a necessary change? Why do the Gibdos not screech? I was eagerly waiting to hear it the first time I came into contact with them. Why can't I use a harness or customize these special horses like Epona? There's no need to restrict that whatsoever. And I had a few instances of heavy frame drops and one moment where there was obvious clipping during a cutscene, but I know this is running on six year old Nintendo hardware. The truth is most of my biggest issues with this game revolve around the story and how it's presented. And that's completely subjective. While I long for the traditional approach, I'm sure there's a number of people out there that love the openness of this story structure. The story itself isn't bad by any means and I did really enjoy it but the desire of always wanting more doesn't escape Tears of the Kingdom. It could be looked at as both a good and bad thing to want more from the narrative. A world that immerses you deeply and has you begging for more information succeeds in its job of captivating you, but Tears of the Kingdom creates an issue of just making the player fill in the gaps with very little context. Story is my favorite part of a Zelda game. I love seeing an epic tale unfold with these characters and the history involving them. So to have moments where it feels lacking is disappointing, but as a whole, I think they did an incredible job with Tears of the Kingdom. The overwhelming majority of my grievances are so unimportant and don't take away from the monumental accomplishment this game is. Six years of development, nearly four years of speculation, and an eight-month marketing campaign created expectations that no game could properly live up to. Especially one that is a sequel to one of the most highly regarded games ever created. But Tears of the Kingdom somehow manages to do the impossible and lives up to the unprecedented amount of hype the game deserved. It's an experience I know I will always cherish, getting to play this game uninterrupted, unspoiled, and completely unique to me. I played for around 115 hours to complete the main story of this game. It only felt like I put half that time into it. It is so incredibly easy to get lost in this game and have it absorb every waking moment of your day. I haven't even come close to finishing my personal playthrough with all the content that's left. I know this game will be widely dissected and replayed to oblivion, but I don't think it'll ever be one I tire of. Here's of the Kingdom took that foundation that made Breath of the Wild special and brought back the necessary elements to truly make it a Zelda game. This is the future of the franchise. Innovation of this open air style while keeping the core pillars of what makes Zelda Zelda is a recipe for excellence. I don't know how you surpass this one. Tears of the Kingdom is a masterpiece. It's a title that will stand the test of time and a technical powerhouse that will inspire and captivate the gaming industry for a long time to come. Eiji Awanuma and Hidemaro Fujibayashi deserve every ounce of credit that is thrown their way. It is with the highest amount of praise and admiration that I strongly recommend The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Woo! It's done. Tears of the Kingdom. Man, I cannot tell you how much fun and excitement that I had playing Tears of the Kingdom. This truly was a masterpiece of a game and I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I did. Thank you so much for watching all of this video. It's it's extremely long, I recognize that. So thank you for tuning in and if you made it to this part, thank you. I really, really do appreciate it. This video was a huge labor of love for this game and uh, yeah, it's the longest scripted video I've ever made it. It was 22 pages of a script and uh, right at like 39 minutes of edited content. So um, yeah, it's it's a lot, but thank you. 
I'll stop rambling. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and turn on notifications for more Tears of the Kingdom content and maybe a live stream playthrough in the near future. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Keep an eye out for that. That's going to do it, guys. Thank you so much for watching, as always. And until next time, I will see you in the next one.